thank you for joining this IOSSP webinar on declining mortality and multimorbidity at death. I am Nico van Imwegen. I'm the Secretary General of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to, on behalf of the Council of the IOSSP. As you may know, the IOSSP is the worldwide network of population scientists. And if you're not yet a member, you should definitely consider to join us as soon as possible. You are most welcome. It's good to know that the core of the scientific agenda of the IOSSP is carried out by our scientific panels, of which we now have 16. These panels are fully member-driven. Topics for panels are suggested by the members. And the panels consist of a small group of high-level international experts. They develop their own work program. And through online tools like this webinar series, many more members can join their activities. So stay tuned to our IOSSP website for uh, activities of our panels. Today, we have the kickoff event of our panel on declining mortality and multimorbidity at death. And we have a great number of participants, which makes it very clear that the topic, which is at the core of our discipline, of course, speaks to many colleagues across the globe. The Council, of course, congratulates our panel and its steering committee for organizing this webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to its initiator and its chair, Aline Desesquel, of the French uh, Institute for Demographic Studies, INED. Aline, over to you and good luck with the webinar. Thank you very much, Nico. So I'm going to share the presentation. OK, so good morning, good afternoon, and also maybe good evening. Um, thank you very much for attending the kickoff webinar of the IUSSP panel on declining mortality and multimorbidity at death. I would like to address a special thanks to Charles Nam, who may be attending this meeting uh, and whose works have been uh, on multiple causes of death have been very inspiring to us. First of all, I would like to uh, introduce the member of the steering committee, Timothy Adder from the University of Melbourne, Viviana Egidi from Sapienza University of Rome, Anna Maria Nogales Vasconcelos from University of Brasilia, and Sergi Triasimos from Centre de Studies Demographics in Barcelona. I will start with a few words uh, about the reason why we decided to launch this new panel. So as you know, all over the planet, there has been an increase in life expectancy and more especially in life expectancy at age 60. And this increase is strongly related with better survival to chronic diseases. The other side of the coin is that this increase is potentially associated with an increase in the prevalence of multimorbidity, which in the studies is usually defined as the co-occurrence of two or more chronic conditions. According to a recent meta-analysis, the overall prevalence of multimorbidity is around 42%, 41 in high income countries and 44 in low and middle income countries. There is a quite rich literature on the topic showing that multimorbidity is related with age, but it's not only a matter of old age, that it is more frequent among females and among lower educational level and socioeconomic statuses, and that it has a strong impact in terms of health outcomes with worse self-rated health, higher risk of disability and mortality. So clearly, multimorbidity has become a key component of epidemiologic profiles, and it is likely to strongly contribute to mortality processes. So as such, we think it is necessary to describe the patterns of multimorbidity at death with a number of questions to answer which associations of causes are especially frequent, how does multimorbidity contribute to death processes, does it increase with age, is it more frequent among females, is there a social gradient, etc. 
We need to examine trends in the prevalence of multimorbidity and to examine how these trends are related to mortality trends. Is mortality decrease associated with increasing prevalence of multimorbidity at death? I will share the speak now with my colleagues. To begin with, Viviana will present the data that can be used to study multimorbidity at death. Then Sergi will briefly answer the question, what for? Team Anna Maria and I will present concrete examples of studies based on the so-called multiple causes of death. And in the end, I will briefly present the possible activities of the panel. Viviana. Thank you, Aline. So to talk, to talk about the data in the data production process, I start from the death certificate. That is the data source generating all cause of death statistics. It's filling in by the physician as well as the coding of the causes of death are defined by very strict WHO rules. In recent decades, many countries have adopted automatic coding systems, improving both the quality and comparability of the cause of that data and making information on multiple causes more widely available. The certification of causes of that, uh, the, the next, please. The certification of causes of death by the physician is the first step in the production process and a key element of data quality. It depends on several factors. First of all, it depends on the correct diagnosis of the dying process and all diseases mentioned on the death certificate. That in turn mainly depends on the state of medical knowledge. From this point of view, the diagnostic progress of recent decades is main, uh, playing a very positive role, ensuring increasing data quality. A second element is the physician's willingness to describe the morbid process as required by WHO rules, which is partly related to the extent to which they have been trained for this specific task. Another factor is the certification style that may vary from one physician to the other, but that may also depend on the characteristics of the dead person or the type of morbid process. This element may explain, for instance, the lower number of certified diseases when the death occurs at very old age, when uh, it's considered as normal, or when the underlying cause is known to be highly lethal. Finally, the certification may also depend on the format of the death certificate. Next, please. Almost all countries adopt the format recommended by WHO. It consists of two parts. In the first part, the physicians should describe the dying process ordered by the disease directly leading to that, the so-called direct cause, to the cause that started the death process, namely the underlying cause, reported in the last line, passing through any disease or condition caused by the underlying cause or, or its consequences. The second part of the certificate is devoted to all other significant diseases or conditions contributing to that, not, but not related to, the, to those in the sequence of part one. When we speak of multiple cause or causes of death, we are referring to all diseases and conditions mentioned on the death certificate, including the underlying and contributory causes in both part one and two. In adopting this format, however, different countries have often adapted the certificate to, uh, to their needs. The, need, the next, please. As an example, you can see here the French certificate, which completely respects the WHO format. There are the two parts, and in part one, the death process is ordered from the direct cause in the first line to the underlying in the last one. Next, please. The same is true for Spanish certificate that also has the two parts and the recommended sequence. Next, please. 
On the other end, the Italian certificate, while adopting the same format, reverses the sequence in part one from the underlying cause in the first line to the direct one in the last line. Overall, however, the format adopted by the different countries is very similar, with a few differences that must be kept in mind when analyzing and comparing the multiple cause of death statistics. Next, please. Let us consider the uh, uh, average number of causes that is the more general, uh, general summary indicator drawn fra from the death certificates. It varies from country to country. As an example, let us consider four countries, France, Italy, Spain and the United States, and the death registered in 2017 at age 50 and over. The average number of causes varies from a maximum of 4.4 in Italy to a minimum of 3.2 in the US, passing through 3.7 in Spain and 3.6 in, in France. Also, excluding ill-defined causes and mechanisms of death in red, on the graph that don't add information about the dying process and are strongly concentrated in part one, differences remain with a higher number of causes in Italy and a very similar values in the other three countries. Next, please. Here you can see the age profile of the average number of causes, excluding it defined. In red, Italy, which has the highest average number at almost all ages. In purple, US, with its characteristic age profile decreasing with age. France in blue, Spain in green. All countries except US show a profile first increasing with age, then decreasing from the age of 75 or 80 due to the age profile, different age profiles sometime in part one and two. The lower average number of causes for all these people is quite surprising, uh, as multimorbidity is associated precisely with older ages. As I said before, it could be an artifact due to a less careful certification when that occurs at very old age. The next piece. This is the average number of causes by underlying cause for the same countries. There is no underlying cause for which the average number is systematically higher or lower. In Italy and France, the highest number of causes is, is associated with, the, with neoplasms as the underlying cause. In Spain, neoplasms and diseases of the circulatory system have the same average number. And in the US, the highest average number is associated with diseases of the respiratory system. However, with the exception of Italy, which always has higher values, whatever the underlying cause, the average number of causes is very similar and varies between two and three. Next, please. All these measures are affected by confounding factors, and it's, bet it's better to adjust them, estimating the net effect of each variable. For uh, This table shows for France and Italy in 2003, and that's over the age of one, the relationship of the number of causes with the variables included in the certificate. The results are expressed as relative risk measuring the effect of each variable when all others variable are held constant. As you can see, they are very similar between the two countries. The age profile, namely the increase followed by a decline in the oldest age groups, is confirmed, while gender indicates a higher number of causes for men. Regarding the underlying cause, some diseases such as those of the musculoskeletal system, of the digestive system, or the infectious diseases are associated with a higher number of causes, and the others, such as the diseases of the nervous system, the mental disorder, and the diseases of the respiratory system with a lower number. 
the two main causes of that, namely neoplasms and diseases of the circulatory system, are in an intermediate pos position. As far as the marital status, never married persons are associated with a lower number of causes, suggesting a possible role of the family network in providing information. Finally, also the place of death has an impact, with more causes reported for deaths in hospital and the minimum for deaths at home. Next, please. Considering the whole process of producing data on multiple causes of death, we can say that there, are, there can be a certain heterogeneity that influence, influences the indicators that, that are computed. This heterogeneity must be taken into account when interpreting the results and even more so when comparing different countries or the same country in, the, in different times. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Viviana. So there are at least uh, four main ways uh, from which uh, causes of death can be listed in death certificates as contributory causes of death. So the first one, and perhaps the most prevalent one, is when, con when the contributory cause is a consequence or a complication uh, of the underlying cause. The second one is when the contributory cause is a consequence of a therapy of the, of the underlying cause. And this, uh, Two first cases usually refer uh, to the case when uh, these causes are listed in part one in the death certificate. Uh, when diseases are listed in part two of the death certificate, they are they could be either a risk factor for the underlying cause, or they could also be a background factor. Usually, some uh, chronic diseases uh, in relation to the underlying cause. So let's see some examples for these cases. So the first one, as a consequence or complication of the underlying cause, one example could be a death from stomach cancer as underlying cause, which is listed uh, at the bottom part of part one in the death certificate. And in this case, gastrointestinal hemorrhage uh, is a direct consequence and complication from stomach cancer. Another clear example uh, uh, is that uh, brain cancer uh, being uh, the underlying cause of death but epilepsy being the, the disease uh, that uh, directly leads to, to death. So the second example, the second case could be the, the case where there is a complication due to a therapy related with the underlying cause. And this is often the case where cancers are the underlying cause of death. And it could be the case for several diseases uh, from the blood system diseases to infectious diseases. Also, uh, there could, uh, the third case was when uh, uh, contributory costs are a risk factor of, for the underlying cause. And in this case, the clearest example is when there is a death of uh, lung cancer or other types of cancers uh, related to tobacco smoking. And the use of tobacco or tobacco smoke, smoking is listed in, in part two in the death certificate. And finally, uh, it could also be the case uh, that uh, causes of death are listed in part two and are a background factor uh, that could be uh, related to that process, but are not uh, within the direct chain of events uh, leading to death. Uh, and this, is, this could be the case for hypertension or high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, or chronic uh, kidney diseases or obesity as well. So, but uh, selecting the underlying cause of death, as Viviana mentioned, is not always uh, as simple as it could be, as there are some cases uh, in which the underlying cause of death is not, uh, let's say, is not the last cause of death within part one, but uh, sometimes it could be that it could be in part two in the death certificate. And in that case, the algorithms that most countries are adopting uh, help to reclassify these deaths and to correctly select the, the underlying cause. But uh, let's see now a couple of uh, examples from which we could estimate some very basic indicators uh, to, for assessing the relationship between underlying and multiple causes of death and the relationship between causes of death. So multiple causes of death analysis uh, are a powerful instrument for health policies uh, because they, they provide valuable information on the burden of disease for several diseases that uh, sometimes are not often uh, listed as underlying cause. So th 
the, there are two main purposes. One of them is, is the one that I mentioned for diseases that sometimes are not uh, listed very often as underlying causes of death. And the second one is to examine the combinations and the relationships between causes of death involving a, a given condition. So the first uh, uh, type of very basic indicator that we can compute is the ratio multiple to underlying cause. And uh, this is done by esti uh, estimating the, the, the number of entries or the death rates from multiple causes of death over the number of uh, deaths or death rates uh, that uh, have a, a given cause as underlying cause of death. So a, st a standardized ratio of multiple to underlying uh, uh, equal to one means that uh, this cause of death, this condition is always listed as underlying cause of death. But when this standard uh, ratio is uh, over one and, 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 and takes big values, it means that uh, this cause of death is usually, main, is usually listed as contributory cause of death. So let's see now an example uh, from a, a paper in population studies. Uh, that analyze uh, different data for, uh, for uh, seven different countries in 2009 and, and computed this uh, a standardized ratio of multiple to underlying. So here in that case, we see on the top of the plot some diseases uh, that are usually listed as underlying causes of death, such as diseases of the circulatory system, system or especially neoplasms. So this means that when neoplasms are uh, listed in the death certificate, they are uh, very often the underlying cause. But it could also be that for some other uh, diseases and causes of death, that they appear more often as contributory causes of death than as underlying cause of death. And this is particularly the case uh, if you see the, on the bottom of the, of, the, of the plot for diseases of the blood, immunological disorders, or diseases of the skin, for which multiple causes of uh, um, that represent that uh, these diseases uh, appear um, many more times as in multiple causes of death as compared to underlying causes of, of death. And there is a, a, another uh, basic indicator that we can compute, which is also based on ratios to assess a bit the relationship between causes of death being listed as underlying and as contributory cause of death. In this ratio, we have uh, in the numeration. In the denominator, we have a given contributory cause among all deaths due to a given underlying cause. And in the denominator, we have the same contributory cause among all deaths in the country. So, and this ratio will express the extent to which uh, this, uh, the, 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 there is a relationship between causes of death being listed as underlying or uh, as contributory causes of death. And the underlying assumption of this basic indicator is that uh, uh, there, is there is the assumption of independence of, of causes. So let's see an example of, of this indicator. In this case, we have uh, data for France for 2003, and we have on the horizontal axis uh, underlying causes of death, and on the vertical axis uh, contributory causes of death. So, and we see at least uh, three observations. So the darker color represents the stronger relationships between causes of death. And the white color represents no association uh, between these causes of death. So first, on the bottom part of the plot, we see that ill-defined causes of death are not linked uh, with any other uh, cause of death, which is quite, uh, quite expected, let's say. So second, we see that on the top left uh, side of the plot, the main causes of death, neoplasms, circulatory diseases, and respiratory diseases are not strongly uh, associated uh, among uh, each other. And another uh, clear observation is that for deaths uh, uh, with underlying cause mental nervous system diseases or en endocrine diseases, which are often uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson, and diabetes, uh, they, this, these deaths are, associ are strongly associated with diseases uh, from the skin, and uh, which is often the cubitus uh, ulcer. But uh, let's see now another uh, example of what could be done uh, very quickly using uh, multiple causes of death. It could, uh, uh, it could be quite informative to assess the relationship between causes using or applying network analysis in which uh, uh, they, uh, they help us to suggest the strongest links between causes of death. 
In this case, this plot uh, refers to data for uh, women older than 65 uh, in Italy in 2011. And the thickness of the, of the lines is proportional to the values corresponding to the joint frequencies uh, between causes of death. And we see that on the left side of the plot, uh, neoplasm uh, uh, play a very central role in this, uh, in this diagram, and particularly unspecified and secondary neoplasms are associated with uh, many other different uh, uh, cancers. We also see on the bottom part of the plot, for example, that some diseases have very strong association, for example, liver cancer with viral hepatitis or uh, chronic liver diseases. And on the bottom uh, part of the plot, on the right-hand side, we can see that uh, there are some other diseases for which the, the, the links between causes of death are not, uh, are not uh, existent or are weak. Okay, thank you. Tim, you have to unmute. My apologies. Um, hello, uh, I will talk about an example of using multiple cause of death data to measure uh, the contribution of overweight and obesity to mortality. Uh, this risk factor is one of the leading risk factors for mortality in many high income countries and is in the top five in both the US and Australia, which I'll provide an example for. And it has high and increasing prevalence in many countries, especially in younger cohorts. So the research I've been involved with has looked at the contribution of overweight and obesity to cardiovascular disease mortality um, in the context of there being a slowing decline and in fact reversal of cardiovascular disease mortality in rates in many countries. And so the, the method we, we have used is for any cardiovascular disease reported in part one or part two of the death certificate with one or more of either of the following causes, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, obesity itself, lipidemias, or hypertensive heart disease. And so any death uh, with this definition uh, is classified as a death related to overweight or obesity, because each of these conditions uh, have a major risk factor of overweight or obesity. And these uh, group of conditions, we use the acronym DCOL CVD. So a cluster of causes strongly associated with overweight and obesity, which we can uh, apply to multiple cause of death data. Next slide, please. So this research looked at premature mortality um, in the US and Australia, so ages 35 to 74. And the two graphs here, um, you can look at the, uh, the green uh, line, which is the decol CVD rate for males, so overweight and obesity related cardiovascular disease mortality. And the red, the red line is for females. And in both the US and Australia, in the most recent year, there's actually an increase in uh, mortality from this overweight and obesity related cardiovascular disease mortality of around 3% per annum. And that's quite a strong increase. So if you ex uh, extrapolate that out to a decade, that is um, you know, a, a, a very significant proportion, uh, significant increase. Um, in contrast, the purple and pink lines refer to other cardiovascular disease mortality. In Australia, it's actually still declining. Uh, whereas in America it is increasing, but not to the same extent. And so by uh, disaggregating cardiovascular disease mortality in this way, this way we can look at the uh, different trends between that which is contributed to by overweight and obesity and that uh, which is not. Next slide, please. It's also useful to look at differentials um, in overweight and obesity related mortality trends um, by by age group. And here in the top charts in the USA, there are um, the, the red line shows the decol CVD uh, rate of increase, um, annualized rate of increase uh, or rate of change rather um, by age group. So from 35 to 39 on the left through to 70 to 74, males on the left and females on the right. And so there is a higher uh, rate of increase in younger cohorts. Um, and I'll, the next 
two charts, I'll, I'll give a bit of an explanation to that. Um, the green line instead is other cardiovascular disease, um, which we classify as not uh, contributed to by overweight and obesity. And that is much lower. And um, there is a similar pattern, but um, perhaps not as, as strong a, a, an age gradient. The bottom two charts show some other data, which is uh, complements these uh, these trends shown, uh, sorry, the differential shown above. Um, the age specific mortality trends are strongly correlated with firstly, the proportion of all um, decol CVD mortality where obesity itself was reported on the death certificate. And that's in the red line. And then the relative cohort lifetime obesity prevalence shown uh, by the blue line. And here you can see that for both those indicators, there is a strong uh, age gradient again, uh, higher in younger age groups, lower in the older age groups. And so both in terms of obesity reported on the death certificate and also cohort lifetime obesity prevalence, um, it is worse in younger age groups, uh, which correlates with the age differences according to the decol CVD mortality measurement. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. Uh, we've also applied this um, decol CVD measurement to uh, measuring excess cardiovascular disease mortality, uh, premature cardiovascular disease mortality uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. Um, it's well known the, the quite high levels of excess mortality in the United States. Uh, and on the left of this chart, the all-cause excess mortality rate for males was shown to be uh, just under 20% and a little bit lower for females. The majority of which um, is, was uh, reported as due to COVID, uh, which is the, the green part of the, the column, of the red column being that not reported as due to COVID. The second to left column shows the decol CVD measure. So overweight and obesity related mortality. Um, cardiovascular disease mortality. And it is somewhat high. It's almost 30% excess mortality for both males and females. And then we, if we do another measurement of two of these decol uh, conditions reported on the death certificate, it's up around 40% excess mortality. And then, then reports of obesity itself is also um, over 40% excess mortality. Whereas other cardiovascular diseases, the uh, fifth uh, column along, from the left uh, was just over 10%. Next slide, please. And so we expanded that analysis to a monthly measurement of excess mortality in 2020. Um, and so the lines here are all causes in blue, red is decol CVD, the orange is two decol CVD, but with two of the decol conditions reported and green is obesity. Um, and the interesting, one of the interesting findings here is that um, obesity, just reports of obesity itself on the death certificate, it was, according to that measurement, there was excess mortality of over 70% um, in December of 2020 in all of the United States. Um, and a, another peak as well in around July. Um, even for the decol CVD measurement itself, it was over 40%. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I will briefly present the result of a study I've been conducting my, with my colleagues uh, from Inedi, Stad, and La Sapienza. So in 2016, we published uh, in the IUSSP newsletter the main result of a study on the contribution of infectious and parasitic diseases to mortality in France and Italy over the age of 65. It is well known that elderly persons are more vulnerable to infectious disease. And in addition to that, infectious disease may not be, underlying, be the underlying cause of the death, but contribute to the death process as frequent complications of other disease or therapies. So we thought it was useful to reassess the contribution of infectious and parasitic disease to mortality, accounting for all causes mentioned uh, on the death certificate, and also using an extended list of infectious disease. I won't enter into these details, but in this study, we did not restrict to the first chapter 
of the international classification of disease, but we included many other uh, disease, infectious diseases that are listed elsewhere in the international classification of disease. So we are the main results. Uh, on this graph, the blue bar corresponds to the mortality rate when accounting only for the underlying cause and for the first chapter of the ICD-10. So with the extended list and accounting for multiple causes of death, you see that the share of the deaths involving an infectious disease increases very much, and it increases from 2% to 21% in France, and from 1% to 19% in Italy. So in, in the end, infectious disease contribute to one in five deaths at age 65 and over, and it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm giving talk to Ana Maria. Thank you, Aline. Uh, good morning for everybody. This is another example of the use of the multiple cause of death approach is in the analysis of the COVID-19 mortality in Brazil in 2020 and 2021. This study uh, is, uh, we are doing this study with my colleagues from Federal uh, University of Minas Gerais. So the approach of the multiple cause of death helped us to describe the morbid process when the underlying cause of death was COVID-19 and its association with other causes, especially with non-communicable disease. In these two years, we had in Brazil more than 650,000 deaths due to COVID-19. And for our study, we analyze all these death certificates and all the causes mentioned. As Serge uh, explained, we have different ways to classify uh, the cause mentioned in the death certificate. In our study, we classify as chain of events and contribute to condition. Uh, first, we identify the COVID-19 ICD codes that in Brazil use B34.2 with uh, U071 for COVID-19 confirmed and B34.2 and U072 for COVID-19 suspects. And then we uh, identify the conditions that appear more frequently in the same line or above this code as chain of events. Uh, as Serge explained, that's uh, uh, the complications or therapy uh, for the underlying cause of death with COVID-19. And the conditions that appear more frequent after the codes for COVID-19 in part one or main in part two, we classify as contributing condition. Uh, our uh, paper are published in Frontiers Public Health and you can have more details in this methodology. Next slide, please. So to perform the multiple cause of death analysis first, we have to decide the level of aggregation of the ICD codes because we have a lot of ICD codes different that are mentioned in the death certificate. In our study, we group the ICD codes with similar diagnosis. And these groups are based on the global bundle disease study and adapted to the Brazilian epidemiological profile. In this graph, uh, we present the 10 most frequently group of causes classified as chain of events in the death due to COVID for the group age of 30 and 69 years old. Uh, the, in the more than 30% of the death certificate for this group of age, we have uh, the, the mention acute respiratory failure and uh, in 2020 and in 2021, more than 25%. And the mention of sepsis, uh, no, the mention of sepsis in 20, more than 25%. And in 2021, in 30% of the death certificate. 
also uh, was found in pneumonia and SARS as the chain of events for uh, COVID-19. These show us the complications and some uh, accept the quality of the treatment. Uh, next, please. In this other graph, we have the top 10 groups of co contributing conditions to the COVID mortality in Brazil for the same age group. Uh, four conditions appear more frequently. Hypertension, almost in 30% of the deaths that she gave in 2020 and 20% 20 in 2021, we have the, the mention of hypertension. And uh, diabetes, uh, in the second uh, top, you know, diabetes and specified type, and we have also diabetes mellitus type 2 as more frequently uh, mentioned as contributing cause. Also, you have, we have renal failure and obesity as seen present for Australia and US. Uh, in Brazil, we had a huge political discussion of the definition of uh, uh, death due to COVID. And we discussed the, the mention due to COVID or death with COVID. And this approach of multiple cause of death bring some light to this discussion. And thank you. Thank you, Ana Maria. So um, I will conclude this presentation with a few words about the possible activities of this panel. So we plan to have a, a webinar once a year. So the first next one is already scheduled. So it will be on uh, September 28th uh, at the same hours than today. We will welcome one or two talks and we already take suggestions for interventions or topics for this uh, webinar. We will share information through the mailing list of the Multicause Network. So the Multicause Network was established in 2012. Uh, it regroups more than 100 researchers and statisticians, both users as well as data producers from about 20 countries with the aim of fostering analysis based on multiple cause of death data and discussing and developing methods. We have a mailing list, uh, a weekly website, and we organize a scientific meeting every two or three years. So if you are interested in joining and receiving information, so please send a message to the address you can find on this slide. We are happy to inform uh, that Tim and I will organize a session on the on multimorbidity at this at the next IUSSP conference in 2025 in Brisbane. So you can start thinking about proposal for communication for this uh, conference. We also may organize training sessions and we could uh, envisage to coordinate a publication from, for instance, a special issue uh, of a journal uh, on, on this topic. So thanks again for your attention. So now we will come questions, comment and suggestion in the chat. So I'm going to look right now at the chat. If you already have comments, you take time to write in the chat your, your questions. So just looking at the first questions or comments. OK, so maybe the first one. Um, so there was a first question about the CDAI graph we've been presented, uh, and uh, it seems like neoplasm were not associated with other causes. So the question is, is this related to the rules to select the causes? So I don't know, uh, Sergi, do you want to answer? Or do you prefer? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Alina. Thanks for this question. So we have to take into account that neoplasms and also circulatory diseases uh, represent a very large share of all cause mortality. And I think that this, uh, this kind of uh, big difference in the share of mortality that they represent as compared to other smaller causes of death uh, plays a role here as well. Uh, for circulatory diseases, we see that the associations between circulatory diseases and other causes of death uh, 
but relatively uh, weak. And because these groups of causes neoplasm and circulatory diseases are quite heterogeneous, I think that it's quite uh, hard to see like a strong associations uh, if we uh, do not split uh, these big groups. Okay, so maybe we can, uh, this, we can take one question which is related to CDAI before going to other questions. So we have a, a question by, uh, I think it's Karen Bishop. Um, so this question is uh, either for Aline or Sergi. Could CDAI be reasonably modified to assess the relationship between any mention on any other mention? You're confined to the UCN part two. Rather, that between the UC and associated causes. Yes, I understand because CDI are uh, in the way they are calculated. So we examine the strength of the association between an underlying cause and a given associated cause of, of this. So theoretically, uh, it's possible to examine the relation between uh, two, two causes, one the other. The problem is that you always need to have a kind of reference. Uh, so with the UC, um, uh, you can do that when you refer to the UC, you, you, you compare the association, strength association between an associated cause and a given UC to the total, the, the total number of the deaths. If you uh, you don't have any reference, so it's difficult to, um, you, you have to establish another reference. So it might be any deaths that have a given mentioned cause. So we haven't been doing that for the moment, but this is something that may, may, may be envisaged, I, I think. Um, we have a question, I think, for um, uh, team. It's questioned by Madi uh, Bajman. Uh, so team, I read the question. I don't know if you can read it. So the question, is the overall age standardized CHD mortality, CVD probably, CVD mortality declining in the US uh, but the contribution of DKOL disease within this rise for age is under 74. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, you, you understand that. Isn't this as expected as life span, a lifespan increase? So I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, so the, the DKOL measure that I used okay. is actually an age standardized death rate for, for DKOL, for those group of DKOL causes. So... Um, what I showed in, in the US and Australia is that there has been an increase in, in the decol death rate, age standardized death rate um, in recent years. And it's actually peaked at around 3% in the most recent year of data. Um, so it's not, not just the contribution of decol within cardiovascular diseases, but a death, the death rate of decol itself, of the decol diseases itself, uh, which has been increasing. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, there is a question for Sergi, but maybe before uh, you answer the question, I can rapidly try to answer a question raised by Reiki. Uh, so Reiki was asking a question about uh, ICD-11. So I'm trying to, yes, this one, this is the question. I would like to know if you're incorporating MCD analysis, adapting ICD-11 so that using chapter 10 extension code, this question is asked to any presenter who might be interested in ICD-11. Um, so, I think that the methodology we have developed at the moment, and we haven't been uh, uh, used it uh, on data produced with the ICD-11 ICD classification. So we, for the moment, we are not uh, aware of what might be the impact of ICD-11 on the methods we have um, elaborated and also on, on um, Will it impact the comparisons uh, of results produced before uh, ICD-11 and uh, after uh, ICD-10, before ICD-11 and with ICD-11? So for sure, this is something we will have to to uh, get uh, uh, to adapt, and we will have to examine this very uh, carefully. But for the moment, we we are not. Uh, well, aware of the impact of ICD-11 on, on our uh, results. Uh, Sergi, would you like to answer the question raised by Domantas? 
Domantasia Zulio is So Domantan is, uh, is asking to you, Sergi, thinking about your recently published study on life expectancy losses by education during the COVID-19 in Spain, what is the potential of multiple causes to study and explain mortality inequalities by socioeconomic status? Yeah, thanks, Domas, for this for this question. So in, well, in, in this study, we use multiple causes of that data to study mortality dynamics in Spain and to explore a bit also socioeconomic inequalities. And particularly in Spain in 2020, it was quite useful to use multiple causes of that data, as uh, especially in the first wave, uh, some uh, that uh, due to COVID were not uh, directly uh, classified as COVID as underlying cause of that, but they, they had COVID in the death certificate being another cause, the underlying cause of that. So we have not explored other type of inequalities based on multiple uh, causes of that yet, but uh, uh, I think that uh, multiple causes of that have a strong potential, particularly for the causes that are not very often uh, linked as underlying causes of death, for example, diabetes or endocrine, endocrine uh, diseases. And uh, they could uh, complement the views on uh, the contribution of these diseases, for example, as underlying causes of death in, uh, in inequalities in, in mortality. So I hope this answers a bit your question, but there is a lot of uh, uh, future research to do in, this, in these lines. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, for the moment, I don't see any other comment or suggestion. So maybe I, I, I should add one, one thing, because um, when presenting the data we are using to do uh, this kind of analysis, we are through our uh, strongly focuses on countries with good quality data uh, in terms of causes of this. Uh, so even though, I'm, uh, and this is what I mentioned at the, the, the beginning of the presentation, I think this, this issue of uh, multimorbidity uh, is not uh, restricted to countries with low mortality. So it is a problem that is concerning um, most countries in the world. It's true that at least to investigate this, um, this uh, aspect on mortality, there is a need to have good quality data. So, but um, this doesn't mean that we, uh, I think uh, we, 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 we already know some people working on uh, countries with less good qualities that start to um, uh, get an interest in, in this approach. So we really welcome uh, research uh, from countries with not so good uh, data on causes of this, maybe with other methods. I don't know, maybe what, I don't know what can be done, for instance, done, for instance, with, with verbal autops autopsies, for instance. But uh, so we sh certainly welcome this kind of uh, research in the panel. And we actually plan to have at one point during the mandate of our panel to have one uh, webinar dedicated to countries with uh, not so good uh, data on causes of this. Okay, so I, I don't think I'm missing any question or comment. Right. Ah, there is an, one another, another one, no. Uh, I, I imagine the question by Doris is about uh, what I was just mentioning to the fact that we are open to a presentation uh, from countries with not so good uh, data. Uh, so the question is, uh, will this be in the 2025 meeting? Uh, why not? Yes. So meeting, um, I imagine you're mentioning the, the session we're organizing with team uh, in Brisbane. So yes, why not? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, and also maybe, another point maybe, uh, 
I should uh, say the word on is about we, we are we are talking uh, today on multi mobility at this uh, and not too much on multi mobility in the general population uh, and as an among the living persons. So of course the two are related, but the relations relation between the two is. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, it's uh, there is a uh, the, the link between the two, and the, it's not so obvious uh, because there is a, also because of the quality of the data, uh, the certification, uh, and also because the, the certifying physician do not have to report all the causes the the, the, the dead person was uh, suffering from. So there is a it's not a gap, but there is a there, there is a discrepancy between the two kind of sources of data. But similarly, so I think it's very interesting also uh, for reasons of uh, investigating the quality of the data on both sides. It's also in, well, also interesting in studies that relate uh, um, information about uh, multimorbidity during the among the living population and multimorbidity at this. So it requires uh, specific uh, sources of data, like uh, uh, quotes or um, merging between, uh, uh, for instance, uh, hospital discharges and cause of death data. But this is also one aspect we, we, we are interested in, in in this panel. Can you get a copy of the slides? So I'm, I imagine, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, yes, it's possible. Okay, and if you need references also, because I see the point by Yeroun, uh, on the, if you, I'm going to copy uh, on the um, chat, maybe I'm, I might copy on the chat the address of the network. So if you want to uh, uh, get access to the wiki website of the network, on this wiki website, we also will find a number of references related to what we are interested in. So I'm going to try to copy right now the email address so that you get you get it. Oops. Ah. Okay. Any other suggestions? So Please remember that we welcome a suggestion for the next webinar we organize in September. So we welcome suggestions right now. So, but uh, also uh, uh, you can sing it over a little bit, but we 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 are, we are happy to uh, also to to discuss with you if you have ideas. Um, and I think uh, Nico, maybe we might maybe conclude this uh, meeting webinar. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, Aline. And uh, thank you to the other panelists, Anna Maria, uh, Viviana, Tim, and Sergi for, uh, for organizing this, uh, this webinar. I think it was a, was a great kickoff and showing the various data issues, methods, applications of multimorbidity analysis. And uh, so I think it's, uh, we're off to a, to a very good start. It was very good to see, and I would like to repeat what you uh, said already several times, that there are many possibilities for, for people to join the network, to join the discussions, to join uh, the debates in either by contributions to webinars or to sessions uh, or uh, papers for uh, also the, uh, the, the session that uh, in, in, in Australia. So that's, that's really great. So please make use of these possibilities to, to, to get involved or to stay involved with this uh, network. Again, do not forget to uh, stay tuned to the IOSSP website. I think we should also try to have a, a link on the, to the wiki page on the IOSSP website to, to make communication a bit, bit easier. But uh, stay tuned to IOSSP as well. And if you are not a member, I repeat again and again, do join us. It uh, brings you very many substantive uh, uh, contributions, but it's also good to, uh, to, uh, to, to be part of the international network. 
And uh, last but not least, I would like to remind you uh, again, and Aline already said that, that we are already preparing the International Population Conference of July 2025 in Australia, Brisbane. It's going to be an exciting conference. Uh, we have seen the conference website. The preparations are going very well, and it's really going to be the, the maybe the, the trip of a lifetime. So be prepared to, uh, to join us and keep uh, in, in touch with IUSP for further information in the IUSP uh, newsletter and bulletins. So uh, last but not least, thank you to the audience for, for great contributions. Stay tuned and uh, stay involved. And thank you for this, uh, this wonderful uh, kickoff webinar and looking forward to much more. Thank you all and uh, signing off for IUSSB. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.